our next speaker is Nenad Rekosevic, who will be telling us what is red. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Greg, and uh, thanks to all the people that uh, donated to pay uh, the cost for my trip so I could uh, make it. I made a lot of uh, red uh, presentations, but uh, people, uh, newcomers to red, uh, are still coming to me uh, with this simple question, just what is red? Because the project has many aspects and uh, I can understand that. So I'll try in this presentation to give you a good uh, view of every uh, part of the project. So let's start by an uh, overview of the problem. It's not my, uh, a picture of my uh, brain cells. It's a computer model of, the, of a global map of the known universe that gives you a good picture of the uh, size of the problem. And it's uh, actually it's a hint at uh, what I was supposed to become because I, I was studying uh, astrophysics, and um, I switched in college to computer science. So my view of the computing world is that uh, even today we are still at using some primitive uh, tools and techniques. So we are not very far from uh, these two guys uh, on the software side. We are still doing it in a very primitive way because we, are, we keep reinventing the wheels and uh, constantly are doing the same mistakes again and again. So AI will be laughing, at least I hope. <laughs> so uh, if we uh, get back a, a bit more uh, on the topic, uh, there are actually uh, a lot of programming languages. If you look at uh, the Wikipedia list of programming languages, this is just the A part, and uh, that, pa that page is not even exhaustive. So there are literally thousands of programming languages. Uh, if you look just there, you will see some languages that were created on the Amiga, the famous Amiga E, and uh, Amos, which was uh, made by a French guy, a very bright guy, uh, whose uh, name is uh, François Lyonnais. And uh, this uh, basic was featuring a DSL, it was uh, a tool I used to have uh, more than 20 years ago. And the DSL was uh, meant for animations. It was uh, compiled to native code. And the whole interpreter and compiler and IDE for Amos was fully written in assembler. <laughs> so this guy was quite uh, an inspiration for me. Uh, so despite so many programming languages and tools, we are still searching for uh, a new, uh, better solution. The problem uh, we are facing uh, every day in the software world are quite known now, but we keep hitting them, uh, like exploding complexity, bloatware. No, I don't mean Java, of course. I'm not thinking about Java. Uh, slow performances, black boxes, which can be closed source software, for example, which are often a big problem to solve bugs that you can't reach. So instead of spending our time hitting these walls, we should have fun uh, doing programming because programming is about having fun. And uh, this is the spirit we should have when uh, we are facing a computer and working on it. It's like in the, those times where Programming was only fun. Uh, since then, since the 80s, uh, a lot of revolutions uh, happened. And uh, currently, we have two, I think, main very important changes in the computing world. The first one is augmenting the power of uh, computers by adding new cores instead of raising the frequency of uh, the CPUs. So this has uh, deep implications for programming tools. Uh, the other main revolution is that we are all now switching to mobile devices. The market is changing very fast, so uh, the programming tools also need to adapt. Um, despite uh, those uh, changes, we are still using very old tools, in fact. So I, I took just the five most popular programming languages from the TOB index, the famous index. 
Yeah, C it's still the main one and it has almost 40 years now. That's quite a long time in computing. And uh, C is absolutely not meant uh, to address the modern uh, needs for computing. And if you look at the other ones, that's almost more or less the same thing. Uh, fortunately for us, uh, some people, uh, some very rare people, were aware of that and uh, capable of uh, giving an answer to these issues. People like Carl, uh, who invented Rebel, fantastic tool, probably one of the greatest invention in the programming world since the last 20 years. So Rebel was a good solution, or a very good solution, for a lot of concerns, but not all. Uh, something I would like to show to Carl, maybe he hasn't uh, uh, seen that. Uh, the wonders Rebel was doing until recently was just the Rebel community uh, praising it and saying, ex trying to explain to people how Rebel was uh, pr a productive tool and expressive. But recently, a scientific study tried to measure uh, the expressiveness of uh, programming languages. So they did it, and Rebel, surprise, is number three. In fact, number one and number two are DSLs. So guess who's the first one? So that just confirms something we all know since the beginning. Rebel is a very productive tool, and that's now proven. Uh, but Red tries to go beyond what uh, Rebel provides, mainly in terms of implementation, not in terms of language, uh, language semantics or syntax, but more in terms of tool chains, uh, implementations, and uh, spreading. So what is Red, uh, really? Uh, Red is uh, what I call a full-stack programming language. Maybe you've heard about full-stack developers. So this one is a full-stack programming language. And its probably main characteristic is that it's a true general purpose programming solution. There are many languages that uh, um, advertise as general purpose, but they are not as broad as uh, Red can be. The other great uh, uh, characteristic about Red is that it's a standalone tool chain, so we are not depending on the standard classic C uh, tool chain, we have our own one. Another aspect, uh, important aspect of uh, RED is it's a fr about freedom. Since the beginning, my motivation for RED was to get free of any kind of restriction, of any kind of limits. So um, I want users of RED to feel the same. So RED is simple to use, thanks to Rebel, uh, but uh, RED has no arbitrary restriction. It's, we try to address every possible need and every possible aspect so it can be deployed, ported to any platform we need. And also something very important in programming, you need to be in, in feeling in control of your tool. Often you use some tools that can be powerful but you don't control them because you don't understand what's happening inside, often because they are black boxes or because they are sitting on a big pile of layers, of software layers, so you can't just know or understand what's happening in the side. And important <laughs> last thing is the fun. Yeah, we want the fun back. And uh, uh, some people that uh, tried to use Red or Red system, after compiling and running uh, successfully their pro first program, came back to me and said, it's great because it's fun, uh, just tried it and it worked and it was great and people get that feeling of what I was uh, talking about in the, the, the feeling from the 80s where you feel really in control of your programming tool. So I'll try to explain what I mean by full stack programming language and uh, true, true general purpose programming language. So I made this uh, chart, the main scope of application for a few of the main programming languages. For example, uh, Assembler is um, drivers and l very low level. Uh, you can see that Java is really limited in the ability to uh, address some different abstraction level. Um, Ruby is quite wide. Maybe uh, it doesn't go down to the OS. I don't know if Ruby interface for calling OS APIs really 
uh, good or not. Ribble has quite a wide scope. Rascal is a very specific programming language, it's a kind of DSL, uh, which is meant for writing over DSLs. So it's standing at the meta DSL level. So where is uh, RED on that scale? Well, RED is aiming at addressing all needs from bottom to the top. Because I don't want to have to rely on another on tool. I want RED, so this programming language, to be able to address all the needs without relying on something else. So uh, you'll tell me that it's quite impossible to make a language that addresses such a wide uh, um, uh, scope and uh, you'll be right, but RED has a trump card. Uh, and a RED system uh, um, covers the low layers and RED covers the upper layers and they are all integrated together and working together. So RED system in fact is a dialect of RED that you can use separately or directly embedded totally in RED. So let's have a look on the platforms that we support. First on the desktop, we support the classic free main players. Uh, we also support some uh, additional uh, operating system like Salable. We would like to support FreeBSD, but uh, we had some low level issues and no FreeBSD free expert among uh, us to solve them. So for now it's a bit stalled, but uh, we could probably uh, uh, get uh, red ported on FreeBSD uh, rapidly. Then we also want to address the embedded market starting with Android that we already support. Uh, next one will be iOS and we already run on uh, Raspberry Pi which is uh, becoming quite popular and uh, I guess Bo will uh, do some uh, demonstration maybe tomorrow. On, uh, uh, we also have um, an experimental port on uh, Arduino's board. Uh, we started with uh, RVR 8-bit, but uh, it's the uh, experiment for now because other boards are coming, uh, like 32-bit boards or the Raspberry Pi, so the 8-bit uh, support may be not the thing to do now. Uh, we also want to support virtual machines. We want to be able to connect to .NET, to the GVM, and to JavaScript. There are basically two methods to achieve that. We can have a bridge, keeping red uh, like it is now, and bridging with uh, these uh, virtual machines, or we can uh, develop a backend, a new backend for uh, red and red system to be able to compile directly to the bytecode of these virtual machines. So we have those two options. Uh, we started by making some uh, bridge for GVM. We'll uh, try to choose each, uh, each time the right solution, the best one for the right uh, job. So probably we are bridging with the GVM, but we will probably compile for JavaScript directly. And with uh, uh, ism.js now, we have a really interesting uh, uh, platform to support and uh, I expect it uh, red and red system to run quite fast uh, on that. More practically, uh, just an overview how it works. So you have red, uh, one binary, you just download and you get all these features. So you can run a script, a red script directly uh, from memory. You can compile it to uh, an executable. You can cross compile it we'll get uh, back to that feature. You can also directly compile a red system script if you don't want to use a red layer but you want to code a low level uh, application. And you can also now compile shared libraries that opens the door for spreading red by uh, plugging it uh, everywhere we can. You can also launch red in a console mode. So we have a red console so cross-compilation, RED is able to cross-compile to other system, from any system to other system. In fact, it's able to uh, compile from any platform where Rebel runs to any other platform. And to achieve that, you don't need a how-to, you don't need a tutorial, you don't need to search on the 
net for how to uh, achieve it, you simply pass a minus T command and a target ID, and that's all. A target ID is just uh, an entry in a configuration file, uh, a simple uh, red dialect, where we just uh, list uh, some options for the uh, target platform. So currently we have this list of about eight uh, targets, so we can cross-compile from any one to any other, as long as Rebel runs on the source platform. So as you can see, we are supporting mainly uh, x86 and ARM-based uh, platforms. Uh, to get a bit uh, deeper inside the toolchain, uh, we have uh, several uh, parts. We have the, the classical couple, compiler, linker. So the compiler uh, layer uh, is able to mainly uh, address those, uh, those two backends, so x86 and uh, ARM. Uh, but we plan to extend it uh, to support ARM v7 thumb mod for ARM processor and 64-bit uh, platforms. We also will add the virtual machines uh, backends, so JavaScript, uh, GVM bytecode, DEX for Dalvik as an alternative for GVM on the Android platform, and MSCL stands for the uh, bytecode name for .NET platform. So the linker is supporting the main file format. We will extend it to also support static library. So we'll be, you'll be able to compile a red application, a red program as a static library. So you can link it later with another toolchain, external toolchain like a C1. And that's another, an alternative way uh, to spread RED and to enable uh, people to use RED in third-party toolchain languages applications. And we also go uh, down to the kernel level and uh, we will provide uh, support for building kernel drivers or even uh, operating full operating system directly from RED. And currently we have an experimental uh, Windows kernel driver support already working, so if there are kernel drivers, uh, developers here, you can have fun with it. And uh, last one, something that doesn't exist uh, as far as I know uh, in the classic uh, C tool chain, uh, we'll have a packager layer which is not implemented yet, but will be soon, and we'll start with uh, the Android APK uh, backend. So the, the point of this uh, layer is just to take several files and package them and format them uh, like the target platform expect them. So we'll support Android, we'll support iOS, but such kind of packager could also be used for packaging web applications. So like Java does for the WAR format, which has a very interesting uh, abilities like uh, simplifying the deployment of web applications and be able to version them or roll back uh, deployment, which is a uh, great things to have. Another aspect of the toolchain is that the, currently the toolchain is bootstrapped in Rebolto. Uh, we are running already two years uh, on that, but the final uh, picture, the final red should uh, have a JIT compiler. And to have that JIT compiler, we need to go self-hosted. So we need to have RED written in RED. That's the only way to get a proper JIT compiler. So we'll most probably uh, work on that in uh, next year. Um, I have a few slides about the RED language in itself, but I won't go into too many details because it will uh, take too much time. So um, the first thing to understand about a red uh, language is that it's very close to Rebel. So you have some of, uh, some of the main uh, Rebel uh, characteristics like uh, definitional and scoping and uh, dynamic binding. Uh, you also have the ability to uh, program in red using whatever paradigm you want. So paradigm neutral is uh, an expression uh, from Gabriele. Uh, and I like it very much because it expresses really well uh, this ability uh, to not be uh, bound by a specific paradigm. Uh, a difference uh, between RED and uh, REBOL is that in RED you can optionally type 
local variables and uh, you can uh, in also type the return value for uh, functions. So in uh, Rebel uh, it doesn't um, have much meaning because it's an interpreter and uh, it, it can't, uh, it has no value for it. But for a compiler, it has a great value because uh, annotating uh, those uh, types in the function uh, allows the compiler to uh, generate a much more specialized code, so a much faster, much efficient uh, code than uh, without the annotations. So uh, red is optionally typed, so you can type it or not, it depends on your needs or your, the way you program. So you can do it in the Rebel way, which will be very flexible, but you will end up with uh, slower performances. Or you can do it in the static way, where you type everything, and the compiler will be able to do more type checking, so you will get some uh, warning or some error directly at the compiler time instead of getting them at the runtime. Also, when you're using the, uh, if you're not using the uh, type annotations, uh, the compiler will be able, in some cases, to do some type inference. So it will be able to guess the types for you. But as Red, like Rebel, is very, uh, very dynamic language, uh, the extent uh, to which you, the, the uh, inference engine can, uh, engine can. Uh, uh, guess uh, those types is quite limited so well it will be a, a little help but not a big one uh, we of course have unicode support uh, red uh, source code is uh, utf8 we provide some external codecs for other encodings and internally uh, basically um, red stores and uh, uh, manage unicode strings like uh, python does in the latest uh, versions. So uh, the internal storage is uh, fixed size, but uh, it can take uh, from one uh, byte to up to four bytes per cut point. Uh, and the system will automatically adapt, adjust the size according to the input and the changes, your, the modifications you are making on the, uh, on the string. Uh, another part that, uh, that's very important in uh, RED is the concurrency support, but uh, currently it's not implemented, so I, don't, I won't go in uh, details uh, about that. Uh, we want uh, to support two main things. We want to support task parallelism, so you can execute several threads of code in parallel use over multiple calls. We'll probably use uh, the actor lay, um, abstractions, but uh, there are other methods of abstraction that uh, since uh, uh, the beginning of the RED project uh, gain a lot of traction, like uh, GoRoutines, uh, which are becoming a big selling point for the Go language. So that's something uh, we should consider also for RED, maybe. Uh, in addition or in replacement to actors and uh, other kind of abstractions. So when we get to the point of implementing the concurrency support, we'll need to revise all the design uh, choices and see if we can uh, update them with, uh, by copying some other successful strategies. We also want to have some level of uh, data parallelism uh, using ever uh, SIMD or uh, multi-core processing. So basically that will be using uh, the ability to uh, parallelize uh, processing of uh, series, of uh, red series. Uh, we would also like to address something that Rebel currently doesn't really address, which is how do you make a dialect? Or how do you make a DSL? Uh, Rebel is great for that is probably one of the best uh, tools for doing that because it has parts and because it has some interesting uh, qualities that make it a good choice for that. But uh, anyway, building a DSL or building a dialect is not something easy because you need to design it first 
and that's already a lot of work and then you need to implement it and implemented uh, implementing a DSL or a dialect is implementing an interpreter or a compiler and uh, for that you are almost left alone with the card so you don't have really a framework for doing that and uh, it's possible to leverage the qualities of uh, the rebel language in uh, red or even maybe in, uh, Re in rebel to make, make a kind of meta DSL uh, that, you, that will allow you to have uh, to be much more productive and give you a frameworks a framework for building new dialect and new DSLs uh, basically it will be something like a higher level version of parse you can think about it like uh, for example uh, having uh, a parse with uh, an event uh, loop and the event loop will be uh, hidden <laughs> something like uh, VB uh, Visual Magic uh, does um, and you will just use event implement events to uh, implement your DSL as an interpreter or as a compiler so uh, red uh, what does uh, the red compiler do? Uh, the red compiler converts uh, red code into red system which is the uh, lower level layer. Uh, I just wanted to show you how it looks like um, so if we take a very simple expression, a red expression uh, the red compiler parse it and use a stack uh, abstraction to put the arguments. In, in fact, it uses it use, uh, two stacks, one for calls and one for arguments. And then uh, the, the emitted will uh, produce red system code based on that. So what you see on the right, uh, right side is the, right, uh, the red system output for that expression calling the red uh, runtime API. Another uh, singular aspect of uh, the red compiler and the red language is that it combines several kind of uh, approaches, uh, which is something I've quite unique, I think. Uh, so basically, you have a static compiler. That static compiler will generate code with an interpreter inside, and tomorrow a JIT compiler embedded inside your executable and uh, all these three parts will be able to uh, work together in a very um, collaborative way so for example uh, the compiler code uh, can call the internal interpreter which itself can call back the compiler code and same thing for the JIT compiler it's a bit abstract but uh, uh, I can show you at the end of presentation a slide to a practical case of such uh, approach and in fact such kind of approach um, is a very powerful tool to solve uh, very complex semantic uh, um, cases for example uh, compiling a symbolic uh, code which is something quite difficult to achieve but if you combine different approaches you can uh, find a very efficient solution So uh, this is just a very simple uh, example of uh, what our red is, uh, our red code is looking. So you have the same uh, principle like in Rebel. So you have a, a marker uh, which is red, followed by a block of uh, uh, what constitutes an header, and uh, your code goes after that. So hello world is uh, just a print hello world. Uh, like in Rebel, and the rest of the code probably looks uh, very much like uh, Rebel, uh, except maybe for the return uh, type, which is optional, but it's, uh, it's the kind of optional typing I was talking about just, uh, just before. So you have an example there. So you are not, uh, it's not mandatory to put it, but if you put it, the compiler will generate better faster code so just a, a 
a bit more detailed view of uh, the internals of uh, red and the different parts so you get a better picture of how all those uh, uh, elements are related. So if we start from the guy on the right, uh, we have a common line front end script which is written in, uh, currently in Rebel 2 and uh, behind it we have uh, the two uh, stacks for the two compilers, one for Red which is uh, shorter because it just emits code for Red system and one for Red system which goes down to the packager so it can emit and can produce uh, binary files and all that is the toolchain written in Rebel 2. On the left side you have the red runtime uh, which is quite a big piece of code actually probably bigger than uh, the other side and which is written in red system so you'll find all the real power on that side for example all the data types um, all the native the mezzanine code the interpreter the bridges like the java one which is already uh, available uh, the memory manager and the interfaces, the low-level interfaces to uh, the underlying uh, pieces. So for example you have the direct access to OS API but also to kernel. On Linux you can do syscalls directly and uh, if necessary you can go even down to the hardware and directly call very low-level uh, features. Uh, maybe I just missed the red console also. Yeah, which is a uh, written in uh, red and red system for the low level parts. About red system, I have a, a small presentation tomorrow uh, specifically on red system because it's a kind of a new thing uh, in red compared to rebel. Uh, so I have just a slide about red system to give you just an overview. Uh, so basically it's just a, a kind of a C level language but with a red syntax so it often feels like coding in red but with uh, very low level uh, data types and uh, uh, actions so it's statically compiled it's currently uh, not optimized at all <laughs> but uh, it's uh, only four times slower than optimized C compiled with um, minus O2 so it's quite uh, good actually it's very good because once we add the optimization layers we'll be very very close to C we probably won't beat it that's not the the, the goal but we'll be very very close so red system will be a really viable alternative to C and it's already already does wonders in some image processing for example that Bo will show you tomorrow uh, something that uh, C language doesn't have or most of uh, very low level language doesn't have uh, Red System has uh, namespaces which are something like context in Rebel but very um, static so we are using context keyword to declare them also in Red System and you can use also the with keyword to uh, put some part of your code inside a context to declare it something like you have in other programming languages. Uh, we have a very limited si type system in, uh, in Red System. Uh, we have six, uh, seven, eight, nine uh, types. So basically the same data types as uh, C. Uh, the function is uh, data type is not a fully first class data type. Uh, I've uh, hesitated a lot about that because uh, if I make it a fully first class data type people will start asking for making Red System a functional language which is not which is possible but it's not the goal uh, it doesn't serve any purpose so I'm quite uh, reluctant to add uh, new features on the, that data type uh, we have a type inference so you don't have to specify the data type for local variables the compiler will guess it uh, we have also uh, limited the type casting uh, between uh, compatible uh, data types and we have something the C language uh, doesn't have 
uh, but C++ has, uh, which is uh, some uh, level of reflections. So you can declare some function in Red System uh, with uh, a variable number of arguments. You put brackets around them, and inside the body of that function, you can work through that list of arguments, and you can query the type of each argument. So that's quite a powerful feature, and uh, actually Kai, uh, Kai DeVos uh, used it to build uh, dialects, VID-like dialect in Red System, which is quite a fit because uh, we don't have symbol <laughs> in Red Systems. So it, it looks like uh, VID, but it's using that uh, feature to, to run it. And it's quite, it's really great. Uh, we also have a preprocessor in a red system, but uh, I would like to drop it in the next uh, major release uh, because uh, that's um, it, we have more problem with that than uh, than uh, uh, more issues than uh, than advantages. Uh, so we'll keep a few of them, but we need to to rethink it and re redesign it. The define is very powerful. Uh, uh, option because it gives you almost the same power as a, a C macros. So you can even use parameters. Uh, we also have and want to have some low level uh, CPU support. Uh, currently, we have some access to some of uh, CPU register in a cross platform way. Uh, we have access to the stack. You can manipulate the stack, the native stack at the red system level in a cross-platform way. Uh, and we will add uh, a support for interruption IOs and other uh, very basic uh, uh, CPU uh, features. Uh, my, maybe we'll add some uh, ISM assembler support, inline ISM, but it's not uh, currently a, a big need. A few metrics about uh, RED project. So it's uh, BSD for the most part of the code base, and the runtime parts of uh, RED are BSL, which is the Boost Software License, uh, which is uh, even more liberal than uh, BSD. So you have even less restriction than BSD. Uh, we are on GitHub since the beginning. We have uh, nine committers. I think it's the uh, wrong number. It's il uh, 11 committers now. Yeah, we have more than uh, 2,000 uh, commits, without counting merge uh, commits. Uh, we have about uh, 500 uh, tickets in the bug tracker, but they are almost all closed. We try to get them closed as fast as possible to avoid peeling them up, because once they peel up, you almost never get them uh, processed. So we, we really need to keep that uh, very, uh, very low. Uh, we have a lot of unit tests with, uh, which are built by uh, Peter Wood, uh, which has done, uh, who has done a great uh, work on that. It's very, very hel helpful. Uh, and uh, you have a few metrics about uh, the size of the source code for the red and red system parts, for the compiler, for the linker. So you can see by yourself that's really small code base. So you can achieve a lot thanks to Rebel. You can achieve a lot with uh, a small code base and a few lines of code. And you can compare that to other tool chains. Uh, and uh, you'll see often one or two orders of magnitude of difference. Of course, we are probably covering more grounds that uh, we do. But uh, we uh, are, um, with such a small code base, we are covering a lot, already a lot of grounds. So, uh, we still have a lot of work. <laughs> it's still uh, uh, under construction, under heavy construction. So we have some uh, big uh, core parts that are missing, still missing. Uh, so typically we have, uh, we need uh, object support, which is not yet there. Uh, we don't have proper error handling yet because we need object for that. Uh, we lack uh, some type checking for arguments. Uh, in some part of the compiler. Uh, we don't have the I.O. yet, but uh, of course uh, objects and I.O. are very high on the list. It, it, they probably will be implemented this summer. 
uh, we want some level uh, of concurrency support in the, the 1.0 and we want to also to have uh, naturally a modular uh, compilation and modular si module system. Uh, we will probably provide a very minimal uh, red IDE which will be probably just a, a code editor plus a, de a debugger and we will uh, work in the future version on that to extend it. Uh, we also want uh, full documentation so that's it's a big uh, showstopper to uh, make uh, to release a 1.0 so we need to we have a lot of work about that to write that documentation and tutorials and of course we need to have a new website for such kind of launch but that's not all <laughs> that's not the real red the real red will be the 2.0 and we have some pretty good cast for that <laughs> So what is the real red? In fact, uh, what I've uh, presented so far is a kind of scaffolding because um, the real red is this one. Uh, the real red will be uh, basically a, a JIT compiler that will be able to work as a static compiler too. Uh, the whole internal ar architecture will be totally different than the current one implemented in the bootstrapped uh, version. So it will be uh, plugin oriented. So basically the compiler and the toolchain will be an empty shell, a framework uh, where you will be able to plug some uh, modules to add features at every stage of the compilation from the parsing to the generation of the files. And you will have a API to work with. So uh, I will provide the framework and the minimum modules to make it work to have the same f level of features than the 1.0 and such uh, API will also be of course documented so anyone will be able to modify add new features to the compiler in a very isolated way in a very structured way and such API could also be called at runtime so I can let you imagine the uh, option and possibilities with modifying the compiler itself and the toolchain at runtime. So it's possible at runtime to change the language itself or to add new features. It's, it may sound totally crazy, but it's something other languages which are uh, in, uh, growing right now uh, are doing. For example, the Scala language is exactly doing that. And some people from the Scala community are using such kind of feature to do wonders in Scala. For example, one uh, very smart guy uh, used this API to add uh, parallel support to for loops by using the GPGPU for parallelizing that using Open, OpenCL as a low uh, layer. So that's a very powerful features and also make, it makes the compiler ar architecture much more um, solid and uh, allows for people to contribute in a much easier way and much more structured way. So the implication is that the current code base of the compiler, so in the red internals uh, diagram, it was the right side of, uh, of the blocks. Uh, the current uh, code base in Rebel 2 is kind of uh, disposable code. So since the beginning I uh, wrote it very fast uh, thinking that we'll, I will dump it uh, quickly in about a year and uh, be able to uh, record it in red uh, rapidly. But we changed a lot of uh, things in the project. We adjusted uh, to the evolving environment so uh, we are not yet there. So we will first go 1.0 in the bootstrapped version and the 2.0 will be the self-hosted version uh, recorded in uh, red, with the toolchain recorded in red. The whole red system, uh, the whole red runtime part will stay the same because it's coded in red system so it will survive and that's a very big code base. 
So the only part that will be recorded will be the Rebel 2 code base, which are basically the Red and Red System compilers. Uh, just a few words about the project organization. We have uh, uh, two uh, collaborators in, on uh, GitHub, which mean uh, two, one uh, admin and two other people that have uh, admin rights. So uh, if I uh, get hit by a bus uh, uh, later, I, people, uh, these two guys could uh, take over the source code, the red uh, uh, repository and uh, manage it. Uh, we have uh, about the 11 uh, contributors to the code base uh, since the beginning. We have a mailing list, we have a Facebook page, we have an IRC channel with a nice uh, IRC bot from uh, uh, Andreas uh, for reporting commits. And uh, of course, uh, we are seeking for other people who are interested in uh, contributing, participating in, participating in uh, every way, because uh, that's quite a big project and uh, we need a lot of uh, uh, helping hands. Uh, last but not least, <laughs> uh, this project uh, I've invested since I've uh, started uh, about uh, two years and a half ago. Every last cent of, cent of saving I had. <laughs> uh, so I'm really believing uh, totally in uh, that project and the success of that project. But uh, I run out of money quite quickly. <laughs> and uh, since a year, I'm living only on the donations that users and followers are sending to me. So I want to thank them a lot because I won't be there uh, without them. And Red won't be uh, at that stage and uh, won't be existing probably if uh, people were not supporting me. So thanks a lot. And uh, we need to continue to support it uh, to make it a reality. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>